My name is Carmen Bolt, the oral historian at William & Mary. It's currently around 10 a.m. on November 15th, 2017. I'm sitting in the Alumni House with Cam Walker. So can you start by telling me the date and place of your birth? Um, I was born August 11th, 1942 in Cincinnati, Ohio. Great. And what years did you attend William & Mary as a student? And we'll return back to when you taught at William & Mary in a little bit. Um, I was a student from 1960 to 1964. Great. So can we backtrack a little bit before jumping into your time as a student and talk a little bit about where and how you were raised and some maybe about your family? Mm -hmm. um, well, I was born in the Midwest and my mother was born in Canada but came down to the States when she was quite young. So she didn't ever have to be um, naturalized actually because her father was. And so when she turned 21, she could just go declare she wanted to be a citizen. Uh, but when she got a passport, for example, she had to have his papers to prove she had gone through that. And my father um, was born in Cincinnati and had lived in different places, but they met in Cincinnati and, you know, that's where I was born. And I was the oldest of six children, um, one of whom had Down syndrome, so now there are only five of us left, but anyway. Um, we moved to Baltimore in about 19, hmm, sometime in the 50s, 1956 maybe or 57, um, for my father's job. And then we moved to New Jersey, to southern South Jersey in uh, 1959 at the beginning of my senior year of high school. So I actually graduated from high school in um, New Jersey, in Moorestown, New Jersey. Uh, my parents gave me the choice of staying with friends in Baltimore if I wanted to finish high school there, but, and I considered that, but then I thought, well, I would probably be leaving home for good the next year, mm -hmm. so uh, I did go to New Jersey. Wow. Um, so when was the very first time college crossed your mind then? Well, we, you know, we assumed we would go to college, I guess, all of us, um, as we were growing up, but in probably the summer of maybe my junior, before my junior year in high school, um, I can remember collecting a lot of college catalogs, just writing for all sorts, because of course in those days you had to write for them and they had to mail them, and looking at them and being attracted to William and Mary just through the catalog, thinking, well, that sounds like the kind of place I would like. It wasn't too big. Mm -hmm but it wasn't a tiny little place. And we, since we were living in Baltimore, um, it was relatively close, but still not in the state or anything. I definitely wanted to, I just assumed you would go away from home for college. Um, and then when we moved to New Jersey, I you know, I had already decided that's where I was gonna go. So that's what, uh, what I did. I remember the college counselor in Moorestown said, oh my gosh, New Jersey's hard to get, I mean, uh, William and Mary is hard to get into for out-of-state women, so you must have a backup. So my backup was Douglas, which is the women's, then was the women's part of Rutgers. Now it's just all Rutgers, but um, you know, th those were the only two places I applied, so. So in addition to kind of the size of the school, what were some of the contributing factors to deciding on William and mm, Mary? I guess the historic part although I hadn't really been to Williamsburg at that point. We hadn't gone as a family or anything, and I came down to see it, hmm, I guess it must have been, the, I guess it was the fall of my senior year that my father and I um, came to Williamsburg. He had some business in Richmond, and so we drove over and talked to the dean of admissions and looked at Ludwell, because in those days, all out-of-state women were gonna live at Ludwell. Um, and it, it just seemed like a good fit, so. Great. Do you remember the very first memory of stepping onto campus, what it looked like, what it smelled like? Hmm. I'm not sure about the campus. I remember riding on the bus through CW and it was foggy mm -hmm. that night and it really looked romantic. You know, it really looked colonial because you could just see the, um, the street lights through this fog. I thought, oh, this is really, cool. Um, as for the college, I, I don't really remember. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, I do remember going out to Ludwell and thinking, well, it's all right, and meeting actually a student coming out um, 
of the dorm and talking to her for a minute. It turned out she was from New Jersey also, oh. <laughs> so that was funny. But um, yeah, that's that's all I remember about that. Okay. <clears throat> And what did you choose to study, or did you know what you wanted to study when you came here, or did that develop as you were here? Um, I think I thought at first I would probably major in English, but um, as I went along, I discovered I wasn't interested in all the English requirements. Um, so then I thought government. In fact, I actually declared a government major at the end of sophomore year, but then over the summer, uh, I thought, no, I'll switch to history, which I did. And I ended up taking probably mainly English history and government classes uh, throughout, and in a way constructing almost what would now be an American studies major, but there was no such thing then, of course. But I took a lot of American literature with Carl Dolmich and others, and um, a lot of American government and American history. Great. And were there any professors, maybe in addition to Dolmich, that stood out to you or that were particularly influential? Yeah, well, Ludwell Johnson, uh, who in those days, or that my years anyway, was teaching the uh, survey of American history. And he was a very funny, witty lecturer, very good. And then, of course, later I took his Civil War class mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and then Dick Sherman. Uh, was my honors advisor, and he taught modern American history. And so uh, those two were certainly uh, influential. Um, in the government department, well, I took a, I had at least one class from Margaret Hamilton, uh, and also one class from uh, Joyce McKnight, and then Warner Moss, who was like the old I guess he was probably chair of the department. I had a, an interesting class with him about, uh, I guess it was Southern politics. Okay. And were there any other advisors or mentors or just key figures that you came into contact when you were on campus or even in the broader Williamsburg community? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I don't think we thought a lot about mentoring. I mean, obviously, Dick Sherman, who was my senior honors advisor, uh, was was fairly important, but uh, I just don't think there was that much emphasis on the whole notion of mentoring in that in those days. Okay, so I noted that Davis Pascal, I guess, started at William Mary the same year you did, or around about that time. Do you recall anything notable about his presidency during the time you were here? Um, well, he was very conservative, and actually, his daughter was in my class. Okay. Tish was in my class, and. Uh, I remember they had an enormously fat cat that lived in the president's house. I mean, it was enormous, and <laughs> everybody on campus knew that cat. Um, so we we heard all the stories about how he, uh, Pasco, had become president as a sort of reward for having presided over the end of massive resistance in Virginia. He had been state superintendent of education. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe we talked about this before, but somebody told me, no, I guess I talked to Terry Myers about this. Nobody can really pin that story down, mm -hmm. but it was a very common story. Um, and I guess the other key figure when I was an undergraduate was Dean Lambert, uh, who had a sort of fearsome reputation, I guess. Um, and I remember I broke my leg, uh, was that junior year? Hmm. I'm not sure what uh, was that. I guess that was my maybe that was my sophomore year. Anyway, I, I broke my leg, but I had a walking cast on it, so I was sort of swinging it, and walking all around campus. And I remember heading over to the calf, and Dean Lambert was coming the other way, and he just said to me, "Oh, hello, Crip." And I was so shocked. <laughs> I mean, he was just being funny. But in those days, we didn't really talk to deans very right. much. So it was like, oh my gosh, uh, that's strange. But anyway, but he was funny. Yeah, that would be a memorable interaction. Yes, with yeah, him, I right. Think. And of course, well, Berdina Donaldson was the dean of women, mm -hmm. and um, we did have some interaction with her. And I think we all thought she was, well, just the stereotype of the dean of women, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. And she taught one. I think she used to teach sections of the. Um, basic 
Western Civ class mm. for a while. But I don't think she, I don't think the history department was terribly fond of her or had much respect for her, but she, she was the enforcer of women's rules. Right. Could you expand a little bit on that stereotype of dean of women, what that... Well, I, I guess sort of rigid and, I mean, the, the rules, especially my first couple of years, were very rigid about um, the curfews and needing permission to do anything. You had to have these signed cards that the house, and of course we had house mothers, too, kept. Um, and I guess she must have handled a lot of the discipline and that sort of thing. So, and... Um, and her name was Berdina, and that just seemed, I don't know, she seemed sort of bird-like or something, mm -hmm. I don't know. I wanted to bring this up in a little bit, but I think this is a good kind of segue into it, these social norms and dress codes and curfews and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you could go a little more into detail about what those were, and then after, maybe ways in which they were subverted, or if they were subverted. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, the dress codes, let's see, we were not... I guess we weren't allowed to wear pants even. Um, and when you had gym class, which was required, you know, we had to have four semesters of some kind of physical activity, uh, you weren't supposed to wear your, you know, your shorts or anything uh, on campus except when you're actually in the class. But of course, every, that was ridiculous. So people just wore their raincoats over the, uh, the shorts or whatever we had. Um, and I can remember wearing pajamas to eight o'clock classes because I'd overslept and you just rolled up the legs and put on your raincoat again. So it was um, pretty convenient that London fog raincoats were one of the things to wear in those years. So everybody uh, dressed in raincoats. Um, the, the other restrictions, um, were, well, there was one when you were a freshman, you weren't supposed to talk to men on campus. Was it after seven o'clock? I mean, it was really strange. Um, and people could actually get in trouble if they were caught. Now, I think it was pretty rare that people were turned in for that, but um, you know, when we had to be in, I think by 10, and because those of us who lived at Ludwell always has to catch the Ludwell bus, and so there was always a dash for the last Ludwell bus. I mean, even if you'd been studying at the library or something, you had to get back home by that time. Um, I think on weekends it must have been 11 or maybe even 12, but um, they locked the dorms. And, you know, as I say, there were house mothers. And uh, I think I usually had pretty good house mothers. We had a, a pretty nice one out at Ludwell. And... Um, I don't remember the ones in, in Chandler, say, um, but, um, and the sorority had a house mother too and she was quite nice, so. Did anyone ever articulate why, like, to the women of the school, why these rules were in place or what the intention was behind, say, not allowing freshman women to talk to men past a certain time? Uh -huh. Uh, well, part of it was just the stereotype of needing to protect women, I guess, and uh, the notion that you were away from home, and so the college had to step in for your parents, and that was pretty common everywhere, I think, at that time. And then just the, the gender stereotypes, the men didn't have any of these restrictions um, at all, so they could... Uh, stay out as late as they wanted, do whatever they wanted. Uh, so that was the other aspect. So it was a combination of the, the in loco parentis and particularly, I think, protecting the women. Right. Now they, I'm not sure what year, but I think, I'm pretty sure before I graduated, they had done away with the stuff about talking to men mm -hmm. after seven and all that for the freshmen. But, um, right. and that may have been only first semester, I'm not sure, but. I, and I think part of it, again, was this business of, well, you're here for education. You shouldn't be having a social life or anything like that. Interesting. But for the women. Yeah, for the women. The men, fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, was there any individual or collective backlash to that, either on your part or the part of others that you recall? Oh, there were always people who sneaked out and stuff. I mean, I don't recall anybody in particular, but there were people who... Um, 
you know, would figure out ways to come in through a window or whatever, be late. So yeah, I mean, people did, uh, did subvert it. But there wasn't, there wasn't really an organized effort. I mean, that came much, much later. Back when I was teaching was when they finally had the famous dorm in and stuff and got the rules um, removed. But it took a long time. Yeah. Wow. Well, did you ever arrive after the doors were locked? No, I never did. I think I was, I was fairly good. So I was usually, no, I'm sure I never had any problem with that. No climbing through the windows no. for you. <laughs> <laughs> so you were, even though there were curfews and restrictions and certain times you had to be back, during the days you, you were very active in organizations and different things on campus. I mean, just naming a few, you were part of Kappa Alpha Theta, yeah, uh-huh. a member of the Women's Dorm Association, the Mermets, yeah. um, the Colonial Echo. These are just naming a few. So what motivated you to be so engaged? Um, well, I don't think that was an unusual level of engagement, but um, the Mermets, I remember wanting to join right away and because um, I had worked in summer camps when I was um, you know, growing up. and was an okay swimmer, I mean, not a competitive swimmer, but I liked swimming, and so I thought, okay, mermets will be a good activity. And uh, I was never one of the really good mermets, but I did do that all the way until, um, I guess, through the fall of my senior year, the second semester I didn't because I was trying to finish my honors um, paper, and mermets just took too much time. So I did that all along, and then in those days, sorority rush wasn't held until second semester. Um, And I guess I went through rush just because, again, I had a pretty conventional view of what people did in college. Um, And so uh, I did do that. Um, The dorm association, well, I was a a Ludwell House president, Mm -hmm. and I guess got into it through that. and then the Echo, I don't think I, I don't remember doing anything much with the Colonial Echo, but maybe I did, but, <laughs> but anyway. Well, for a couple of these things, well, for the Women's Dorm Association, I'm wondering what your role was in kind of enforcing or upholding or challenging those rules that were in place. Yeah, we didn't do any of that. Um, let's see, when I was a Ludwell House president, we, of course, had to enforce them. Um, and I, again, there wasn't a lot of trouble about it, I don't think, but uh, mainly we had to be, there would be two of us, you know, there'd be roommates who were sort of in charge, and we had to take turns being there on Saturday night or something like that. You, you had to be around. Um, and I don't actually remember any particular drama at all. You know, maybe we just had very <laughs> good kids. <laughs> um, uh, it, I'm trying to think even how many people at Ludwell, there, were two, there would be two units together and uh, maybe three floors, four floors. It wasn't a huge number of people that you were responsible for, maybe 30 overall, something like that. Um, and one incentive for doing that was that you did get your room free. Mm-hmm. So that, that was a nice um, benefit of that. And then in the association itself, I think I was in charge of um, editing the little booklet for the next year. But again, um, we d- we really weren't doing much about trying to change the rules mm-hmm. that I remember. I think we just sort of accepted them, thought, well, this is the way it is. Okay. And you mentioned being a part of Greek life was really, and I think just in doing some research and flat hat and just knowing what campus culture was like at that time it was a really major thing mm-hmm. at that time what was the experience of just being part of Greek life here mm. um, I think what was good about it is that um, because the houses were so small and you only lived there senior year uh, you had a lot of friends across um, other sororities or people who weren't involved at all uh, so that was nice I think when I talk to people who live, work, I mean, who went to school on much bigger campuses where they moved into the house right away. Um, it, it seemed for them that the sororities loomed much larger than they did here. So, um, I, you know, I wouldn't say it dominated 
life at all. Um, but made some good friends, um, and it, you know, so I enjoyed it. Um, I was not terribly active in terms of being an officer or anything. I think I was, I think I was assistant treasurer one year, and then I did not want to mm -hmm. be treasurer <laughs> because that was a lot. So I forget, maybe I was secretary or something. Um, but I was not one of those people who was really, really involved in, um, you know, made it a big central part of my life. But I, I did enjoy it. It definitely sounds like it was a good way to meet individuals. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. From but again, the, they were small, fairly small in those days compared to now. I mean, you could have the, the meetings were in the house. And now I think, <laughs> I don't know where they meet, um, around campus, I think, because they're mm -hmm. just much, much bigger. And I guess the population of William and Mary has definitely grown oh, yeah. in, <laughs> since Ton the yeah. time you were here. Yeah, tons, yeah. So what are some of your very favorite memories or experiences from your time as a student at William and Mary? Mm. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm. Oh, dear. Well, I don't know, I guess, well, I enjoyed some of my classes, I have to say, that that was a good memory. Um, I'm trying to think, I don't, I don't know. We pretty much were confined, not confined, but you know, we pretty much lived on campus. We, very few people had cars, uh, so you weren't ranging wildly. And of course, Williamsburg was much smaller too, mm -hmm. so um, you know, we would go down to Corner Greeks once in a while. Um, hmm. I don't know, I don't have any any great emotional, <laughs> or else I've forgotten them, I must say. It's mm -hmm. been so long, but, um, you know, good friends and um, uh, sort of, I guess, just goofy things that, that college students do, but nothing, nothing really stands out. What sort of goofy things? Do well, I don't know. I mean, I remember Let's see. When we were, uh, when my roommate and I were um, Ludwell House presidents, I mean, we would have sort of gatherings for people's birthdays and mm -hmm. stuff, and and we had some sort of colorful people who who sang or who played ukule ukuleles were big for some reason. I mean, <laughs> bigger ones, uh, not teeny little ones, and and. Um, things like that and I guess in the sorority too there was a sorority sister who was a pretty good singer um, and people who would make up songs and stuff uh, so uh, trying to think we must have had some costume things too like on Halloween but I don't really have any again very strong memories of it but I think we did so no memories or photos of things you dressed up <laughs> as back in the no, day? No, now we, for, um, for homecoming, those were the days of the floats where you stuff them with uh, um, crepe paper and Kleenex and stuff. I'm pretty sure we dressed up as something one year, but, and there are probably pictures somewhere, but I really don't remember. Because I think one year maybe Theta actually won the float competition. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, I think in one of our previous conversations, it was right before homecoming, and we were talking about how homecoming is very different, or did the way they do the parade is oh, very yes. different now. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. that comparison? Yeah, yeah. Well, the whole thing was was actually a pretty big deal, and um, the there was a big southern emphasis because of the KAs and. Um, they would actually say they were going to secede from the college for the homecoming, and so they would dress as Confederate soldiers, and maybe the Friday, maybe the Thursday before homecoming, they would actually go around to the dorms and deliver the invitations to the homecoming dance to their girlfriends by standing outside the dorm, and maybe they even had a bugle and stuff, and they would sort of deliver the invitation, and then on the day of of the parade, um, their dates would actually try to dress as Southern Bells. Oh. So I think there must be pictures of that in some of the old yearbooks. They, I'm they sure. would, and they would stand right there at College Corner by the wall. And there used to be, until really just a few years ago, there was a, 
a, a kind of stand, a, a, a traffic island right in the middle there. And Dean Lambert actually would stand there and he would accept their secession. They would actually present him with some little piece of paper, you know, saying, we're seceding from the college for this day. And um, he would accept it. And then the parade would take off down to the Capitol and then come back. Oh. Um, and they used to bill it as the only homecoming parade you could see twice because it would go down and back. Um, but that was, that was the most distinctive thing, I think, about mm -hmm. the parade in those days. And um, it wasn't until, I'm sure it was back when I was teaching, that there were finally a lot of protests against the KA uh, se secessionist thing and so on. And the black students said, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> this is not really what we think the, the college should be condoning. And so then um, Dean Lambert didn't take part anymore. Nobody mm -hmm. from the college took part. And gradually the KA thing died out, I guess, right. under protest. But but yeah, that was, that was colorful. Yeah, I would say. Yeah, that was going to be one of my questions about that because while there wasn't an African-American presence on campus while mm -hmm. you were a student year, I was wondering just regionally how... There were students coming from out of state, of course, yeah. being one of them, how that was received. Yeah, yeah, it seemed, it, you know, it just seemed very different mm -hmm. to me, although my father had southern relatives and southern roots, so, you know, we had certainly, and, and, and so I'd heard sort of positive things about uh, the South, mm -hmm. but um, having been born in Cincinnati, of course, and, and lived there until I was about 12 or 13. We'd heard a lot about the Underground Railroad and so mm -hmm. on, so I definitely identified with the northern side of things. But um, yeah, so this, this did seem pretty exotic. Um, but uh, yeah. That right. And it was like, it was an actual part of the whole parade process. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And we would go watch. I mean, people would, you'd be down there and you'd see them march up and do the secession business and you'd see all the, the women. I don't think I knew anybody, I don't remember any of my friends mm -hmm. ever dated KAs or you know, had much to do with them, but right. anyway, they, they definitely were a presence. Yeah, a spectacle, you can definitely yeah, go yeah, in yeah. and see for sure. So thank you for sharing those memories of things you all did for fun or, yeah. um, but I want to shift gears and talk about any difficult experiences that you recall and how they affected you, whether they were academic or social. Or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Except for breaking my leg. <laughs> I don't really remember uh, anything very difficult. But that, um, it was a, a hairline break down by my ankle, and I did it playing um, intramural softball oh, nice. out on... Barksdale Field, which wasn't really Barksdale Field then because Miss Barksdale was still around. In fact, I had a class from her. Um, but I just fell a little distance. It was just a little incline, and I just fell. And I thought it was just a bad sprain, you know, because it hurt. But I could move everything because it was, it was a hairline break. Right. So I went back to the dorm, and, um, you know, I kept my foot up. But by the next day, it was really swollen and really painful, and I thought, oh, I better go to the infirmary. So I went to the infirmary, and they didn't x-ray it or anything. They just um, sort of looked at it and said, yeah, it's a bad sprain. And the, the joke in those days was that they would give you these little pain pills that were, were they green or yellow? But everybody said, oh, well, that's if you go to the infirmary, they're just going to say, yeah, take these pills, and you'll be fine. So that's what they did. But it. Um, it didn't get better at all. So um, I finally went back and they sent me to, it must have been a local doctor who was a you know, sports medicine person or something. Mm -hmm. So then they x-rayed it and they said, oh, guess what? Yes, it's broken. And, uh, and so I had to get the walking cast mm -hmm. and um, I had to use a cane for a few days, but fairly soon I was able just to as I say, swing around on it or something. It had a, like a rubber bottom so you could walk with it. But I remember that that happened to be a semester when I had all kinds of classes on the third floor oh, of all kinds of buildings. Of and so I was like, ah. Oh. And 
Well, I guess it was sophomore year because I, I was living in um, Chandler and I was, I think it was on the third floor there and there were no elevators. So I quickly learned to sort of swing up there. So that was a pain. But meanwhile, um, my, I guess I had told my parents and my father was furious. He said, I can't believe how bad that infirmary was. And we did think the doctor was mm -hmm. not very good. Um, I mean, they just you didn't expect much from the campus infirmary. Um, and so I remember he wrote a very angry letter. And, and at some point I must have gone to have it checked or something and the doctor said, you know, you ought to try to calm down your father. And I thought, I can't calm down my father, you know. Oh my anyway, goodness. so, and I, I didn't get it off until I went home and then I guess the, you know, my local doctor took it off and everything and looked at the x-rays and he said, oh, you're really lucky because there were some bone chips and if they'd gotten into, um, the ankle, you could have had a lot of trouble. And I thought, oh, I'm glad I didn't know that. Oh <laughs> you know? my goodness. So it turned out, it, I mean, it all came out okay, but that that's about the, the worst thing I remember. I don't, yeah. I don't remember any other uh, great traumas or anything. But yeah, uh, I can see that marring in an experience. Yeah, to well, I, as I say, I do remember, especially, it, again, it's such a contrast to now when they pay so much attention to health and wellness mm -hmm. and now they worry about them the mental health counseling and all sorts of things i mean it was just not like that at all i mean there was in fact the infirmary was over where i guess where part of the reeves center is now those older buildings mm -hmm. along there it was very small and mostly people tried to avoid it because they just they thought well they're just going to give you these little yellow pills and say eh, you'll be fine my goodness was there ever a point where, at least during your time here, where that changed, or was that just the reputation of the infirmary all the way I through? I think it was all the way through. Um, wow. Yeah, because one person I knew actually ended up with tuberculosis. Goodness. Yeah, but she thinks she, they thought she picked it up uh, from a little shop that was over on Prince George Street, a little place to eat. So she had TB, and she, I guess, had to take a semester off. Um, and I guess, well, there were people certainly who had mono. Mm -hmm. That was a big thing. Um, but yeah, I don't remember that they really improved <laughs> the health system at all. But Wow. And, and most of us, I mean, were pretty healthy, I think. We survived anyway. Yeah. yeah, no, that's a good point. I'm thinking about walking around with a cast on this campus even now, how the brick pavers and just how inaccessible it would be even now so I can yeah yeah only no. imagine. now they of course use the golf carts yes. for people but yeah. um, and as I say I it luckily it turned out once it was set and so on uh, the pain pretty much went away so it wasn't painful it was just awkward to mm -hmm. be sort of you know you sort of swing your your leg around and stuff and as I say going up and down the stairs I got pretty good by the end because yeah. I think I must have had it on for six to eight weeks. Wow. So, yeah. Well, and you had an interesting, if um, awkward, encounter with Dean Lambert to <laughs> yeah. come out of it. Yeah, so. that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm thinking about whether or not there were any controversies with among students or with administrators during your time here that stand out to you. <sighs> Well, nothing too directly, but things I heard about, because mm -hmm. I, I knew somebody who was active in the theater, and I'm pretty sure I remember that uh, at one point, the theater department wanted to do a play that involved um, black actors, and they wanted to do a joint, something joint with Hampton, and Pascal said no, and then, um, there were also stories that he did not want to let black people go to the campus center even after, well, 64 though. Well, anyway, after the Civil Rights Act, it would have been um, illegal to borrow people from that, um, but he was not happy with that. And then, I'm trying to think if there was anything else about race. Yeah, I don't know, it was still just a very, very southern place. I mean, virtually all the cleaning staff and so mm -hmm. on um, were, were African Americans. Um, the town, 
was pretty segregated. Uh, in the bus station, they had you know four bathrooms right. you know, with black, white, mm -hmm. two for women, two for men. Um, we did. I would say we didn't have a whole lot of contact with the town, townspeople. Uh, it was you were just much more on campus. I think in those days. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't remember too anything else really. Mm -hmm. Did it stand coming to William Mary, even recognizing it was kind of a southern school at that time, did it stand in contrast to your experiences living in Cincinnati and Baltimore and um, just the difference yeah. in race relations or diversity? Hmm. Yeah, a bit. Um, I mean, when we lived in Cincinnati, we, I remember, I guess, when um, Brown versus Board of Education passed, I remember thinking, oh, well, what's the big deal? I mean, we, we lived in a, a white suburb, uh, but there were, you know, you didn't, you didn't see a lot of overt segregation. Um, now, Baltimore, there, I mean, that was much more Southern, obviously, and, um, there, they had desegre legally desegregated the schools, but what you had was one of these emerging patterns uh, where such and such school was simply known as a black school and mm -hmm. such and such was a, a white school. So I think my junior high there, I don't remember any black people. When I went to high school, uh, and there they had, you could go anywhere in the city, but of course, again, there were schools that were known as predominantly white and those that were mainly black. But um, I know there were, there were black people, black women in my high school. And there also the high schools, the public high schools uh, were gender separated. Mm -hmm. They still had um, two main women's high schools and two main men's high schools. Now there were others that were um, integrated in terms of men and women. but. Uh, the, the ones that were considered the better schools were still single sex. So that was kind of interesting. And that was, I guess I should say, that was another reason I liked William and Mary is I did want to go to a co-ed college because I had been uh, through, now when I, when I graduated from Moorestown High School in New Jersey, that of course was a regular, uh, just normal high school. So I had been in school with, um, with men in the classroom and stuff, but I, figured I had done my bit of, of being in an all-women's environment, so I did want to go to a co-ed college. Right. Um, so, anyway. Mm -hmm. <coughs> also, I'm, I'm thinking of other things that were going on in the broader United States and world during the time you were here. Obviously, the United States was in the midst of the Cold War and Vietnam War, in fact. Mm -hmm. There were tensions the Civil Rights Movement, uh, the mm -hmm. Cuban Missile Crisis happened during your time mm -hmm. here, and of course the assassination of President yeah. John F. Kennedy. How did you see all of this yeah. nationwide things unfold on campus? Yeah. Um, the Civil Rights stuff, not much, but yeah, the Cuban Missile Crisis, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah, that was my uh, junior year. And I remember we all, it, was, it happened right around, or reached its peak, right around midterm time. And we actually said stuff like, well, should we bother to study? I mean, what's going to happen? And there was a lot of talk about um, that this would be an area that would be targeted because of all the military installations. Mm -hmm. And there were rumors that there were nuclear things stored under the Colonial Parkway or something, who knew? But, but you know, there was Camp Perry. Sure. So there was, there were a lot of, there was a lot of feeling that if there were some kind of nuclear exchange, this would be one mm -hmm. of the main targets. And people debated, well, maybe that's good. I mean, we would just be gone. We would suffer, it would be the first strike. But yeah, that was, that was very tense. And, um, but you know, we didn't have access to the news, mm. the immediate news in the way you do now. Um, certainly when I lived at Ludwell, the only television was one, I guess the house mother had one. And I remember for, uh, when I was a freshman for the um, presidential election, she rented a, 
I guess we all went in on it, and she rented a TV that we could all watch so we could watch the results. And maybe we even watched one of the debates. I'm not sure about that, but I know we watched the results. Mm -hmm. um, so that, yeah, but the Cuban Missile Crisis. And then the Kennedy assassination, yeah, I can remember that pretty vividly. Mm -hmm. um, I was walking across campus. I guess I was coming over toward the sorority house for lunch <coughs> when I first heard about it. And then I was going over to a class when they hadn't said whether he had died or not. And as I was walking, people started saying, oh, mm -hmm. you know, he's dead, he's dead. And we thought, oh my gosh. And so I think at that class, it was a German, I think it was a German language lab, maybe. And I guess they turned the TV on for that over there so we could watch that. And then um, that whole period, we, by then I was living in the sorority house and we did have a television. And so I remember everybody was um, sort of watching that the whole time and um, you know, just being quite upset about it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that that's one of those things you do remember where you were when you Absolutely. heard <laughs> heard that. Yeah. yeah. And what was the general feeling? I'm just thinking things even within the past couple of years politically have been so tense and at moments felt very dire. What was the general feeling then, I mean? Yeah, well, it was, some people were really, really upset. Um, I remember thinking that Lyndon Johnson would be okay, as th that I thought, I was reassured that um, he would be okay as president, uh, that he had all the experience and mm -hmm. so on. So I thought the country would be okay. Um, but it did seem really, really shocking, and I know, I know some of the faculty members later said they had been just horribly upset mm -hmm. by it. Um, I guess we, a lot of, many of the students were, in a sense, too young to have been really maybe involved in the, say, the election mm -hmm. campaign and so on, uh, because in those days you had to be 21 to vote. So I had not even been able to vote in that election. Um, and I had been brought up in a, a Republican household, mm -hmm. uh, especially my father. I think my mother was always a secret Democrat, but she didn't right. say much, but he was a strong Republican. So we were you know, not huge Kennedy fans. I mean, we weren't brought up that way, but a lot of my friends' parents worked in the federal government and so on, and, and a lot of them were, were very much Kennedy fans. So mm -hmm. they were probably emotionally the most upset and then uh, I mean the rest of us were just shocked probably right so yeah absolutely and you made a good point earlier that the access to media and constant news yeah. t entirely different yeah um, just not having the the mechanisms for giving every individual news constantly no um, no you just I mean you got updates and of course for something like that uh, people like Walter Cronkite and so on would be on the mm -hmm. on the television almost continuously, but you know you you certainly weren't walking around with <laughs> uh, your smartphone or anything like right. that. Yeah. And then I'm thinking also for the Vietnam War, which at a certain point was known for um, very specific information being given to the public. So mm -hmm. you're hearing very specific mm -hmm. things about what was happening in Vietnam. Were, had those tensions escalated that far yet w during the time you were here that you saw mm -hmm. students reacting on campus? Mm -hmm. I'd say that was that was a good bit later mm -hmm. uh, by the time I, when I was in graduate school that began to be uh, more of an issue but mm -hmm. mm -mm, not not much right. and I mean the big escalation comes later mm -hmm. so uh, I don't really even I don't even remember hearing very much about Vietnam as an undergraduate, but certainly not not as a big issue. Right, not the activism stuff that we would come to expect mm -hmm. in the protest. No, no, it's much later, okay. yeah. Okay, great, well, just reading through all those events and things that happened during your time here, though, wow, yeah. what a time to be a college student. Yeah, and yet we were so much more isolated, you know, I, I think that's the big difference. You really were in much more of a little bubble on your campus, and this was a conservative campus, so, mm. you know, it, I mean, 
people, you, you could read the newspapers, of course, and some people had the papers delivered or you could read them in the, mm -hmm. in the library, but um, there just wasn't, and I, I remember, I guess I got, I guess I got Time Magazine. I, I got some sort of news magazine, mm -hmm. and I remember one of my roommates, though, never read any of that stuff. You know, it was like politics. Yeah. Right. I don't pay attention to that. I do other things. So it, it we were not woke, <laughs> as, they say, <laughs> as they would say today, I guess. Oh, excellent usage of that <laughs> yeah, term. Right. I just was reading a Spike Lee thing. Oh, right. <laughs> he, he yeah, that's about that. great. Yeah, yeah no, um, that makes complete sense. Now you would have to actively cut yourself off from all of these things to not hear yeah, constantly exactly. about right. what's going on. Wow. Yeah. Okay, great. So I was thinking we could transition to your time leaving William and Mary for graduate school and then yeah. coming back. Yeah. So you left to go to Yale for yeah. graduate school. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. And how did that experience compare to William and Mary? Did you feel prepared? Um, I worried that I wasn't. No, I mm -hmm. thought I wasn't uh, prepared. And I guess in the end I was fairly well prepared. Well, I, I guess all right. But no, I, that, that seemed pretty daunting actually. Sure. Um, and after two years, I then went off to teach um, at uh, Knoxville because I was, I was sort of burned out mm -hmm. and I was thinking, oh, I'm not sure what I'm doing here or what. Because um, I would say that was not a very, well, New Haven is a very gray, grim place, it seemed to me then anyway. Uh, and I had some good friends, but uh, I don't know. It, uh, as I said, I was sort of burned out. Mm -hmm. So um, I applied to the, I'd had a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship, so right. I knew they had this teaching internship program. And I applied to that, and they assigned me to Knoxville College, uh, which I think no longer exists. I think it's failed mm -hmm. or been taken over. But um, so I went off to, uh, to Knoxville, and there, uh, by that time, the civil rights stuff, well, I mean, obviously it was happening the whole mm -hmm. time, and, and I was much more aware of all that by then, but um, I actually heard Stokely Carmichael. Oh. He came to campus, and uh, there was a, we all went, and th there were quite a few white faculty at Knoxville, um, but anyway, uh, we went, and he, gave a sort of rousing talk, uh, mainly aimed at getting the students to be more active. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that he was advocating overthrowing the government or anything like that, but sure. it was like, you students need to get out there and be doing stuff. And he, uh, he said at one point that in the black community there was too much uh, concern about color, and he said, I bet they had a thing called Miss Knoxville College. It was like the homecoming queen or something. Mm -hmm said, oh, I bet Miss Knoxville's always light, bright, and almost white. And it turned out, actually, he was wrong that year because the woman who'd been voted, Miss Knoxville, was a very popular student, very cute, but she was pretty dark. And so the kids all hooted at that, like, no, you're not right. you know. But he said, oh, I know you guys just want to get out and buy your Ford Mustangs, mm -hmm. which were the big car then, and all this stuff, but you should be more concerned about what's happening in the the broader community and so on. And he had, he had some folks with him who would ask him things. I think they were sort of planted questions so he could make his pitch for oh. um, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and so on. And he did talk about the honkies. And you're sitting there going, oh, here I am, a honky. But there wasn't any real hostility um, toward us or anything like that. But after his talk, I noticed a lot of the kids did sprout afros mm -hmm. because before that time, a lot of people had processed hair and stuff, but you know, the afros then started coming in and like, oh. And in fact, it, in, at that time, this would have been 66, 67, um, on a black college campus, people really dressed up to go to class. I mean, you know, so, Carmichael coming and, and the whole image of SNCC with wearing the overalls and being part of the people and so on was a challenge uh, to them, and and that that happened. Um, so anyway, so that was that was interesting, and I really got interested then in African American history and so on from 
um, <clears throat> from being there. Yeah. Um, and in terms of the Vietnam War, one thing that came up when I went back to New Haven was uh, people would ask me, well, well, what were the kids like um, in Knoxville and were there any protests? And I said, actually not much because a lot of um, African Americans were in the military and it had been seen as a positive force. You know, it was a way up and out. It was a way to get the GI Bill and sort of get out of um, poverty and so on. So there was a lot of support for the military in the black community and we didn't there weren't many protests about Vietnam at Knoxville uh, at all. And then the, the surrounding community was pretty conservative too, so there wasn't anything. So, um, But when I got back to New Haven, by that time there was a lot of protests and you know marches around the New Haven Green mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, so, But even there, there was a strong conservative element because there were a lot of um, Eastern European immigrants who mm. were very anti-communist, uh, understandably, and right. so they, when when issues about Vietnam came up, they tended to strongly support the government and say, no, no, North, North Vietnam is a communist regime, you've got to fight it, you've got to stop mm -hmm. them. Uh, if we don't win there, you know, they're going to take over South, all of Southeast Asia and go on to Australia or whatever, that whole notion of the red tide. Right. So there was there was some conflict there, but of course on the campus it would be mainly um, anti, anti-war. And those were the days of uh, William Sloan Coffin, the um, <coughs> chaplain mm -hmm. who, you know, would, well the kids would burn their draft cards and stuff and give them, he would preside over those things. So wow. there was a lot of anti-war feeling then. Right. It strikes me how different, though there was, it seems like a, maybe a thread of conservatism at the institutions you were attending or teaching at, uh -huh. um, how different still they each were. William and Mary in Virginia, and then Yale in Connecticut, and then yeah. Knoxville, Tennessee. Yeah. I mean, just how different. Yeah. How, how did you prepare yourself or adjust <laughs> to going to such a different... Yeah. Hmm. Well, certainly going to Knoxville was so different because it was a predominantly, I mean, it's a historically black college. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was different. Uh, I don't know, just sort of rolled with it, I guess. And, um, and you know, you just sort of change and... and learn and pick up things from the surrounding environment. Sure. I do remember, um, it must have been after my first year at Yale, uh, that summer I had the last camp job I ever had and I worked at a, a camp in Connecticut um, and I can remember there sometimes we would have conversations, the, the counselors and so on, uh, about Vietnam and I remember then resisting some of the more radical arguments that people said, oh, it's really all about oil or it's all, it's mm -hmm. just an imperialist struggle. And I remember then thinking, no, I don't, I don't quite buy that. I think that's, that's uh, you know, that's, that's not really what's going on. Um, and even now I don't think that. I think it was more the, the broader uh, Cold War mm -hmm. effort that we, that led us to overlook <laughs> the fact that it was also a nationalist struggle, mm -hmm. but I think that a lot of it had to do with just the general Cold War and that, that firm belief that there was this red tide and so on, right. and that you had to take a stand. Uh, but yeah, that, no, it was just, uh, I don't know, you just change with the environment, I guess. Yeah. Learn more. <laughs> well, that's a really good approach to have. Not everyone <laughs> does take that approach, but yeah, to yeah. have that, yeah. especially going somewhere as different as Knoxville. And you said it was at Knoxville that you really turned your sights toward African-American history? Yeah, I think so, yeah, yeah. Was there any event, or was it the culture of being there? Well, it was the, the culture of being there, learning a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that, yeah, that was... Well, did you always know you wanted to pursue a career in higher education, or? Um, hmm. Well, not always, but I think um, once I decided to major in history and so on, um, and my father always said, well, what about law school? But at that time, well, there weren't that many women in 
uh, law school. Mm -hmm. And also, my image of law was that you had to go into the courtroom and argue that that's what you did. And I thought, uh, no, I don't think that's for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't really want to do that. Uh, and so teaching seemed like the, mm -hmm. or I guess I did think at some point about maybe trying to work in Washington um, on Capitol Hill or something, because I was pretty interested in, in politics. Uh, but I think my mother said to me, you know, but you'd be working for somebody else all the time. I thought, oh, no, that's not too good either. <laughs> so. Um, teaching at the college level uh, did give you a lot of autonomy, which I'm certainly grateful <laughs> for having had that. Sure. So that worked, yeah. Yeah, and did you have any particular teaching philosophy or style? Um, well, I, I don't know if I could really put it as a philosophy, but I think I was I most enjoyed and was probably best at seminars in small mm -hmm. groups more than the lecturing. Um, so that, I would say that was, that was what I most enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I liked getting to know the students in that kind of setting and, um, and I did best with the really smart students too. Of course, that's because it's easy. You mm -hmm. don't really have to do very much except encourage them and, and help them and so on. Um, I don't think I was as good at reaching um, weaker students or students who needed um, maybe a lot of a lot of help. Uh, mm -hmm. What thinking about this interview, I went back and looked at my old grade books because mm -hmm. I did keep all of those. Uh, partly because in the first few years after retirement, you're still getting requests for recommendations and right. things. So I thought, well, I better keep that. And I must say, when I look at my first several years of teaching, I gave a lot of bad grades. <laughs> it was really tough. Um, but I, I had, it was funny, I had sort of a split situation in that I taught the honors, there was an honors class of uh, the basic introduction to American history, 201, 202. So those kids were all great. So those grades were all A's and B's, but then in my bigger lecture class, there were a lot of C's and D's, F's, I failed people, it's like, oh my gosh. These days I don't think, I don't know if anybody ever gives anything much below a B minus. Yeah, I don't know, but you might have been the professor to watch out for, the ones I know. That I think <laughs> others I, warned yeah, students I about. I think that probably was my reputation for, for the general, uh, the lecture classes, but mm -hmm. anyway, yeah, no, I was surprised. I thought, oh my gosh, I really was tough. <laughs> Anyway. So, how did you find yourself back at William and Mary a handful of years later teaching? It, yeah. Um, well, when I was looking for jobs, um, I think my about my year or a couple years after, like the very end of the 60s, the early 70s, were the last time there were a lot of jobs for mm -hmm. college teachers. It just wasn't a big crisis the way it is now, where you think, oh my gosh. So. Um, there were just, I guess I registered with the placement bureau at Yale, but I actually had a job offer in Memphis where I was doing some research. Um, I was actually in the public library there looking up something and got talking to somebody who found out I was interested in working on African American history. And he went back and talked to somebody at, uh, what college was it? It was a small, was it a small Catholic college? It was a small college in Memphis, and they were looking for somebody to teach African Americans. They said, oh my gosh, we've got a job. Do you want this job? And I thought, well, oh, wait, <laughs> this is a little, I said, well, wouldn't you need to see my, <laughs> my uh, uh, transcripts and so on? I said, well, you could send them to us or something. So when I went back, I did, I did have them sent, but I thought, oh, this is really strange. Um, I guess it was Lemoyne College, anyway. Um, I thought, well, that's a nice backup. If I don't find anything else, I could always go there. But um, I didn't. But then it turned out William and Mary had a job, uh, and it seemed like um, a good fit. I mean, I had liked it well enough as a student, mm -hmm. and, and knew again the size and so on um, that 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 would be good. So um, I came down and interviewed and got the job, so. Right. 
And so just so we have it on record, what years did you, were you at William & Mary teaching? Well, this, <clears throat> I came in the fall of 69, and I'm pretty sure it was 2002 when I retired. I retired early. I retired when I was 60, uh, partly because my husband is older and he had already been retired mm -hmm. for about three years. And uh, if we wanted to travel and so on, it would be much easier if I were retired. So that worked out. Sure. So in the time since you left William Mary as a student and all those experiences you had in different areas, mm -hmm. did that change your perception of the school or impact your perspective when you returned? Yeah, I think so. And, and the school was changing by then, right. too, um, because I remember was it the very first semester it was back? Anyway, I remember there was actually a peace march down Duke of Gloucester Street, and I guess I was talking to Dick Sherman or somebody saying, wow, I can't believe William & Mary is actually doing this. Mm -hmm. And there had been some activity um, you know, while I was away in graduate school that people talked about. There had been various protests and um, things, and I thought, ah, oh, things are really finally changing here. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, so that, that, that did strike me. And uh, obviously they continued to change in the early 70s. There was, for this place anyway, quite a bit of activism. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was, yeah, that was good. Could you talk a little bit uh, more about the types of activism you saw, especially in the early 70s, yeah? Mm. Well, there was, um, let's see. There was anti-draft activity, and I'm trying to think. Um, Ed Craypole in history and David Jones in philosophy had what? They had had some kind of conflict with the administration over maybe draft counseling that they had done. Mm -hmm. I remember that, and um, that was actually before I came back. But th they were seen as the ra radical professors. Um, and then, I'm trying to remember what else about, there was just a lot of, there was just a lot of talk, and a lot of anxiety, I think, among the male students about drafting and being drafted and so on, and um, talk about, well, should you give better grades? I mean, what happened if you, because I know there was one student that I ended up giving a, a fairly bad grade to uh, because he just wasn't doing anything. He was totally distracted. But um, people saying, oh, but you know, that might put him at risk for getting sent to Vietnam, getting drafted or something. So there, there was talk about that sort of thing. Um, let's see. Well, of course, with Kent State, mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of demonstrations and um, we postponed exams and that sort of thing. There were a couple times when um, the idea was that students could, or that we would, you would either postpone classes or you could hold classes but no one had to come. But there were always enough conservative students, I think, who didn't like that, that I think often I would hold at least be there and maybe a few people would come and we would simply talk. You, wouldn't, you couldn't really go on with the subject matter very much because you know, 75% of the class wouldn't be there. Right. Um, but anyway, so there was a lot of that and then um, there was all the, the protest about the dorm rules and mm -hmm. so on and I remember um, at one point they took over James Blair and Dean Lambert was still around then, and he actually was pretty good. He went in, I mean, they had the police outside and all that stuff, but he went in and just talked to them, and I think maybe they spent the night there. Um, mm. There's a local person in town, Brenda LeClaire, who was a student then, and she was quite active in that, and I can remember seeing some of us kind of went in the the downstairs of James Blair and talk to some of the kids or talk to the ones who were outside and so on. But I think Brenda, I think she spent the night there. You know? wow. uh, so you might at some point try to find her and, mm -hmm. and get her take on it. Yeah. Um, so that, yeah. Mm -hmm. But there was just a sense, 
I guess when I came back that oh, William and Mary's finally joined the real world. That it was it was much more in tune with um, what was going on. I mean, certainly not a Berkeley or Madison or anything like that, but um, but much more active uh, right. than it had been. Right, and of course during um, the time you were away was when the first three African American students in residence were admitted mm -hmm. and you had other key individuals in the black student community like Warren Buck yeah. were then here and mm -hmm. so I'm wondering how you saw civil rights kind of find a place on campus yeah, as yeah. a result of that. Yeah. Pretty sure I remember going to hear Warren Buck play music. <laughs> <laughs> he was popular. Um, well, I went back and looked, and I did teach my first African-American history class in the spring of 1970 mm -hmm. here. And it was a pretty big class, but I think, I'm pretty sure there were no black people in it because there were, would have been so few students. I mean, I, I didn't teach any of the three women right. uh, ever. So I think that was an entirely white mm -hmm. class Although it, at one point, what happened was I would alternate um, the African American history with the New South. Okay. Um, and I'd actually been hired to teach New South, but nobody, I said, well, what about some black history? Mm -hmm. uh, and nobody objected. They said, yeah, if you want to, go ahead. Um, and I'm trying to remember, I think, that's where I should have tried to find, tried harder to find an old syllabus, but I think probably those classes focused on the period from the Civil War to the present. So mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, it wasn't the entire sweep of uh, black history in one semester, I don't think. Um, that would have been a big undertaking. Yeah, that would have been a lot. Although there was a lot less available in mm -hmm. those days and, uh, than later on. But um, at one point in those early years, um, one of the secretaries in the history department was African American and she sat in and I remember she told me at one point uh, just from reading some of the stuff you know this stuff makes me really angry mm -hmm. and I said yeah Freddie that's right <laughs> yeah, you should be mm -hmm. and she was from a well-established black family here in town okay. but uh, she said oh well, you know I never I never learned all this stuff right so anyway so um, you know, that, that was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have, I guess it would have been 74, yeah. I tried to put together uh, a program about the 20th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education. And we did do it, and we had, we tried to get John Lewis, and I think he could not come, but of all people, Marion Barry came. Mm -hmm. But that was when, before all his troubles. And he, you know, he was, in his youth, he was a, a good civil rights worker in Nashville and so on before the drugs and so on. Um, so he came and talked and I've forgotten who else we got. There were some other good people. Um, the turnout for that wasn't great, mm -hmm. but uh, we did we did have that program. Yeah. So that was good. Um, I'm trying to think of my other impressions. But there there was interest in, in black history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask, so I, I noted that class um, titled The Negro in the United States since 1861, does that sound right? Yeah, that's right, mm -hmm. yeah, because I, I did the war, that's right, so right. I did their role in the war. And then, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Right. I had a, the description was an examination of the role of black man in American society from the Civil War to the present. The uh -huh. course will consider political, economic, and social developments within the black community as well as problems in black-white relations. Um, which was an incredibly relevant course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm wondering what your thought process was knowing that there was a very, very small uh, black cohort on campus at the time that you would be teaching predominantly Caucasian students yeah, about yeah, this. What, yeah, how did yeah. that? You know, I guess I just plowed ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, but that, no, that, that's true. Um, yeah. Well, it seemed to me, I mean, I suppose those were more my crusading days or something. I thought, people need to know mm -hmm. this, and they don't know it. Right. <laughs> so. Um, but you said there wasn't any um, pushback or anything from the administration oh, when no, you uh -uh. pitched that? No. Nope. Uh, what about for the celebration of 20 years? Was, it was no, just, nobody. Uh -uh. Uh, no, that, that, was, that was fine, too. Mm -hmm. People didn't really object. Uh, as I say, if, if they didn't, 
they just didn't come or something. Right. They didn't care about it and right. things that. But yeah, no, that that worked. And um, very early on, for some reason, I had to give a talk at the local high school for some sort of I don't know what some sort of assembly. Mm -hmm. And I talked about W. E. B. Du Bois, I think. And I I think it didn't. I think I wasn't pitching it right to the students. They were probably bored to tears. But um, I remember I got a ride with somebody from the administration, um, and he he was asking me about that. Like, well, is that how you pronounce his name? Mm -hmm. And well, I didn't know much about Du Bois. And I said, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, but as I say, nobody really objected. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's great. I mean, you introduced that, at least within the history department, yeah. that type of study. Yeah. So that was incredibly important. Mm -hmm. So in addition to different sorts of civil rights that activism that was happening and war-related activism, I'm wondering if you saw second wave feminism unfold in any certain way on campus. Um, obviously, by that point or a certain point, the dress codes and those strict regulations were finally mm -hmm. cut, yeah. but did you see that unfold on campus in any certain way? Yeah, I think, I think it was um, certainly beginning. Um, I'm trying to think the first time I taught some women's history. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure when that was. Um, but yeah, there, there was definitely uh, more activism and more faculty interest. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, sociologists and I'm not sure about the English department, but probably there were there were courses there that that mm -hmm. had a feminist um, approach. Um, yeah, so that that was happening too. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think about well. Uh, it's just hard to see. I'm not sure I can think of any incident or sudden turning point. Uh, but there were, mm -hmm. there were more women being hired. Um, so, because when I was hired, well, Nancy Ferris was here, and she was a Latin Americanist. Uh, but she left, she left fairly soon after I was hired. She went to Penn. Um, and then her temporary replacement was uh, a young woman from the UK, and then Judy Ewell was hired. Mm -hmm. And so then Judy and I were in the department. Um, and I think for a long time we were the only two, and then gradually more and more mm -hmm. over the years, obviously more and more women were hired. Okay. Uh, and there were certainly women in the English department. Mm -hmm. um, sociology, psychology, um, hardly anybody in the sciences in those early years. Uh, nobody in econ for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so. Yeah, that was, that was gonna be one of my questions because I've noted that about one third, give or take, of the history department now our women faculty members. Mm -hmm. So I was going to ask what it was like. I, I sat down with um, Judy Yule previously, and she noted also that it was the two of you for yeah. a good while there. Yeah. How, can you describe how it, like what the experience was to be one of one uh -huh. or two women in uh -huh. the history faculty and how you were interacted with or treated? Uh -huh. and yeah. Um, well, this, I, my experience is probably different because I had been a student, mm -hmm. and so a lot of these people I had known, and they knew me, sure. and um, there just wasn't any particular problem that I, you know, ever faced about that. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I'd, there wasn't. It, I guess it didn't seem all that strange. Um, it was just the way it was. Right. Um, I'm trying to think. Well, as I say, there were, and I, you know, I became friends with women in other departments. There mm -hmm. were enough that you did have a sense of, you know, there, there's certainly women faculty around. Um, 
Oh, Linda Riley, I think, came the same year I did, and she was in uh, classics, and she was a dean for a while, and so on. So there were, you know, there were women who, mm -hmm. who had some power, and then there were various women in the administration. Um, Harriet Reed, she held a number of different mm -hmm. jobs. I've forgotten what she was doing exactly when I first came, but she was in admissions for a while, and then she ran sort of career placement for a while, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and fairly soon Juanita Wallace was hired uh, in the uh, admissions office. So, you know, but no, it, as I say, probably my experience is not in any way typical mm -hmm. since I had been a student and I came in knowing a lot of these people. Sure, yeah, sure. Did you find that you retained kind of the same mentors you had as a student or did anyone else step into that role or as a comrade during your time here? Uh, no, probably I retained a lot of the same, especially Dick Sherman, mm -hmm. because we were interested in a lot of that. He had done a lot with African-American topics, uh, not his first book, but his, his some of his subsequent ones he got very interested in um, African-American stuff. So we would talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, so probably the, the same same people, mm -hmm. and then um, my office mates and so on. Uh, one, the first several years, there were three of us in a, a fairly big office, um, but we, you know, luckily our schedules <laughs> were such that you could still sometimes have office hours. You could have students in there, and the other two would not be teaching or something, but. But one was Boyd Coiner, who did the Old South. And then the first year, um, a guy named Bill Leary from UVA, who also was interested in African-American mm. stuff, but he hadn't, I don't think he'd been able to teach the class. I think he was mainly doing uh, just the survey class. And he was only here, I guess we only overlapped one year, maybe. Um, and then uh, Jim Thompson came in, and he also did Southern things, but not, he didn't do African American stuff, he did Southern intellectual history. And so Jim and Boyd and I shared an office for a couple years, and then when we moved to Morton, we all had our own offices. But we were, I was still friends with them, I mean, we were all in a row there. Yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering, and this may have been an issue that those early years you were teaching her might have come along later when I spoke with Judy, she went on record talking about salary discrepancies, which mm. has been the case um, nationwide, worldwide, yeah. in all sorts of industries, but was an issue that she personally experienced here, uh -huh. um, fighting for equal salary to colleagues, male colleagues, and was that something um, that you personally addressed or personally experienced? Um, you know, I don't, I don't really know, I, I mean, I, don't, I probably experienced it, but somehow I was never that focused on it, mm -hmm. although I did certainly um, take part in some of the, the petitions and so on. Right. But Judy probably had better insight from her days as chair and so on of, of mm -hmm. seeing everybody, but somehow, I mean, maybe that was a typical women's reaction that they say we don't fight hard enough for salaries mm -hmm. and so on and somehow I I really didn't like to deal with that aspect I must say okay. uh, so I just didn't I wasn't one of the key ones but I did support uh, people and I was on committees and things where we you know we drafted um, protests and wrote reports and stuff like that right but I was n not one who was going to go in and argue with the dean or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were plenty of people in the in the department, I mean, men too, who would argue about their salaries and just go in and say, well, I've done this, and why is so-and-so getting more, and so on. So mm -hmm. in addition to gender <laughs> discrimination, they felt there was other discrimination. Yeah. I'm wondering if you saw, well, it's kind of all wrapped up in this, but I'm leaning back toward this idea of different socio-political things going on in the world during the time you were here. And even past, I guess I'm looking um, more into the 80s and the 90s and even the early 2000s things that went on. It's, 
I mean, you were here first as a student and then as a teacher for two of those big moments that everyone remembers where they were when it happened, the um, JFK assassination, of course, but then, of course, 9-11 uh -huh. as well. And you were here for such a broad span in which the world was rapidly changing. Yeah, and yeah. I wonder if any of those events or um, just moments in time stand out to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, I'm trying to think. Um, I mean, certainly 9-11, uh, I was just, you know, horribly shocked like everybody else. And I think I had a few students in one of my classes. There was somebody who, I think, like, did he have relatives in the World Trade Center or mm -hmm. close friends or something? Um, so that was, you know, that was kind of shocking. But um, I'm trying to think. I mean, I think the the political stuff probably had more impact in that I was teaching, you know, when you're teaching right up to the present, mm -hmm. um, it, it's hard. My, my husband and I used to sort of argue about this because he was teaching much older history mm -hmm. where the debates aren't so, aren't so relevant really, right. I mean, and he would always say, I can't understand you American historians, you're so political and so on. Um, and in a sense I've thought since I retired, I'm certainly glad say that I'm not teaching right now because I would think it would be very hard. Right. Uh, and I would be pretty open with my classes about my own attitudes, but then I would try certainly try to be very fair mm -hmm. about listening to theirs and so on. But um, you know, there were students I'm sure who thought I was some raging liberal and didn't like it. But um, mm -hmm. mostly it was it was okay. But it was sometimes that was that was kind of hard. I remember um, what election was it? It may have been. Was it Jimmy Carter versus Reagan? Anyway, there was some election where it was very clear <laughs> that the Republican was going to win. And, um, but I kind of joked with the class. Oh, I guess I was going to vote, the, one of the few times I ever voted for a third party, I was going to vote for Fred Harris. And I said, well, if my candidate, no, if, you're, if your favorite wins, um, I'll bring donuts or something. And of course, I mean, I knew I was going to bring donuts because my favorite was not going to win at all. Yeah. So we would joke like that. Um, but anyhow, that, uh, you know, some of that was, it was sort of tense. Uh, and also teaching, well, civil rights and um, black history in general and even New South. Um, there were students who would push back about, well, no, the slave slavery was not the main issue about the Civil War. Yes, it was. No, <laughs> you know. And I would, I mean, I would try to explain how slavery was um, at the root of so many other things that they would name. Like mm -hmm. they say, well, it's really states' mm -hmm. rights, or it's economics, or it's something. They say, well, yes, but what's you know what's the basis for that? What's underneath? It's slavery, protection mm -hmm. of slavery, and. Uh, in fact, I met somebody on the street just a couple of years ago who I didn't recognize, but he recognized me and said, oh, yeah, I remember your class. And he said, I remember that you kept telling us, yes, slavery was the cause of the Civil War. I didn't believe it, but you were right. Mm -hmm. um, and one time I remember um, a student objected to Malcolm X. I was having them read the autobiography of Malcolm X, right. and he thought I was defending Malcolm X's early life as a criminal. And oh, why am I? Why are we reading this? Why are you defending this guy who was breaking into houses and stuff? And you know, so I had to talk about the fact that, um, in some ways, this is a autobiographical trope. There are many famous autobiographies where the person talks about his or her early bad mm -hmm. life and then the <laughs> reformation and moving on to mm -hmm. new purpose and so on. I said, I'm not defending you know, what he did, but he changed and he's explaining to you how 
he became a black uh, became a Muslim and so on how this changed his life uh, so there were there were cases like that where people would um, be unhappy with uh, you know with the reading or or thinking I was trying to defend something that they didn't think was true or mm -hmm. defensible I'm wondering also if it those classes in the readings you um, required didn't also have the opposite effect as say the African American community here at William Mary grew uh -huh. and so maybe you did ha start having some of the individuals from those mm -hmm. communities in your class and then they were reading these things I wonder if they viewed this as a safe space or a, a positive thing or if you ever yeah. had any interactions yeah sort of hard to tell mm -hmm. um, hmm. I remember one <clears throat> student I had who's now I think an administrator somewhere in New York. Anyway, she, I remember she wrote a, a paper on Polly Murray and actually got to interview her. Mm -hmm. um, and I think mostly, uh, I think mostly the, the black students, you know, it seemed to like the classes okay mm -hmm. and so on. Um, I think I did try to be careful not to do the business of saying, well, give us the black perspective or anything like right. that because you certainly don't want to do that to, to students um, and there were still so few in in my day that there there often wasn't a big body of you know black students in the mm -hmm. class that might be just two or three or one or two at a time especially in a, a small seminar because right. um, I had I had classes later on especially after they after Mel Ely came and pretty much took over the African American stuff, I had a had classes like uh, the Search for American Identity, oh. where we would have black, white, um, all sort of ethnic mm -hmm. groups, immigrants, all sorts of things. Um, yeah, so yeah, it was mm -hmm. it was. I don't remember any particular uproar or anything like that sure. well that class you just listed sounds fascinating and I wish I had taken something <laughs> yeah. on identity like that because that question is ever relevant I know I always know. trying to define what that yeah. means yeah yeah that was that was fun um, and sometimes you know that's why I was trying to look up some of the teaching work I thought oh my gosh I've forgotten all these mm -hmm. different things but sometimes they were freshman seminars sometimes they were maybe at the sophomore level, because we went through a, several curriculum changes over my time. And, uh, and then we had things like Project Plus and various honors, interdisciplinary honors classes and the service class. And so, you know, uh, there were all sorts of, which was fun because then you could, again, nobody ever objected to the topics uh, sometimes you had to check and make sure it wasn't overlapping with somebody sure. else's course, but uh, I would say that was one of the real benefits of, of teaching here, that there was a lot of uh, autonomy for the, for the teachers. And especially um, later on in my career when I was doing more of this interdisciplinary mm -hmm. uh, work, the department never objected or, or cared. Fine. Partly, history was big enough so that, you know, it wasn't that I was not teaching something that needed to be taught in history, which was an issue for people from much smaller departments. Sometimes sure. they just couldn't be freed up to teach in the interdisciplinary courses. But, um, but those those were good courses. Those were fun to teach. Yeah, absolutely, and definitely that having autonomy in a job is something I yeah. think anyone would value, especially being able to choose the types of courses. Yes. Yeah and the information that you were, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You were teaching students. Um, so I noted that, and you've listed a couple of these earlier on, that while you were teaching and very busy as a professor here, you were also involved in different committees. Um, you, and, and a lot of the things you did when reading through the list, it really just seemed like there was a focus on really bettering William and Mary or making it more inclusive or, mm -hmm. or just addressing certain things. Um, mm -hmm. Like you were part of the Affirmative Action Advisory Committee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, were considered on campus as a crusader for social justice in the 1970s. You mm -hmm. participated in different workshops for the BSO, 
wrote an op-ed um, on the setbacks of racial progress in the 1980s, mm-hmm. and, and so much more. I mean, the list. Yeah, yeah. So can you just talk about any of those things you were involved in that stand out to you or why you chose to be engaged yeah, in what you were? Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess <laughs> it is funny because I looked back at that affirmative action report a couple years ago when one of the students in a class was doing something and they had gone through the archives and found it and I read it over I thought, wow, I was a crusader <laughs> in those days. <laughs> but um, I think the stuff I was interested in, in in terms of committees and so on was focused more on students and the educational process. So I was less interested in, well, things like the faculty salaries or faculty mm-hmm. benefits, you know, because there were committees where you could do all of that. and. Um, Somehow I was, I thought that the issue of, of the students and the the educational process was was somewhat more important. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, we well, we did try to do a, a lot of stuff. That's right. I oh gosh, the BSO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there were there were you know various African American students that I got to know fairly well. Um, one that I. A bit surprised. I haven't seen that he's been back for any of this stuff. Was Rodney Williams, mm. who teaches dance, I think, at Longwood now, and he was a great kid. I can remember walking across campus with him, and everyone knew him. Yeah. Absolutely, everyone greeted Rodney. I mean, it was it's like, oh my gosh, you must know everyone on this campus. Um, or just before I retired, uh, Devin, I can't even remember Devin's last name, but he's somebody who went on into library science and information mm-hmm. science and so on, and he's done quite well. And uh, I, I taught him as a freshman in one of these freshman seminars. He was a Gates Millennium Scholar. Mm-hmm. Um, so there were, you know, there were, there were a lot of kids uh, that were interesting. Um, I'm trying to think. I did try to bring well, I was active in Phi Beta Kappa, mm-hmm. um, and there I tried to bring interesting people to the campus, because I figured if I have to do this work, <laughs> you know, I'll try to bring in good people. So we had John Ashbery came once as the poet, um, Stanley Kaufman, who was the f- prominent film critic and drama critic, um, else came. Well, we got we got some good people. Um, I'm trying to think who else we brought in. Oh, for um, honorary degrees, I remember I suggested Eudora Welty, and she came, and she was great. And that was when George Healy was, I guess, vice president. I remember he kept saying, "Oh, she was so wonderful. I'm so glad you <laughs> you uh, nominated her." And we got Robert Coles here. Um, so. And who else? There was somebody, somebody who came, and then people thought the performance was sort of disappointing. Maybe it was a graduation speaker, and now I can't think who it was. Anyway, maybe an African American or something, somebody famous. But <coughs> anyway, I did read at one point, and this was for a different interview I was doing, that Jesse Jackson came at one point, and oh, yeah, had the turnout wasn't quite what. Was oh. expected, so I don't know if that's what you're referring. No, to no, that no. I remember. I think he came a couple times, mm-hmm. and one time I think the turnout was quite good. Okay. He was very good. Yeah, he was over at William and Mary Hall. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, he was good. Um, yeah, Jesse, and yeah. So, yeah, a number of notable figures yeah, were brought in, yeah, and that yeah. is one way to definitely engage students is yeah. to bring in bring in the names mm-hmm. and let them actually hear and see these people. Sure. Yeah, definitely. I think now there are many more endowed. Things like the Hunter B. Andrews, oh, right, yeah. uh, uh, whatever they call that, speakership or <laughs> yep. internship or whatever they yeah. fellowship, um, that now they can bring in more people for several days and have mm-hmm. them go to classes and stuff, and that's that's really helpful. Um, it was harder earlier. We just didn't have much money, so you really had to try to <laughs> say to people, well. Well, we can only offer you X, but could you come and so on? And people did. So. Right. Great. So I, ca- I have a couple more 
specific questions before opening up to some broad questions. Okay. And then after that, I will open it up to you to add anything that we haven't covered or that you want to add. Um, so as you know, we're in the midst of celebrating 50 years of African Americans in residence. And next year we kick off celebrations for the 100th anniversary of co-education here at the school. So I'm wondering how you have seen diversity and inclusion at the school evolve and change since you came here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's been massive, yeah. of course. Um, now, in terms of women, there have always been a lot of women uh, uh, students. Um, but, um, yeah, the, the diversity is just amazing. I mean, I really noticed it just walking around campus now, there's so many more Asian-American students, African-American students, um, all sorts of, of people, uh, international students. So that's that's really good. I think that's that's just an amazing change. I think I'm pretty sure even when when I retired in two thousand two, there weren't nearly I don't think there were nearly as many, say, Asian American students. I think that must have really boomed in recent years, perhaps because of the diversity in Northern Virginia, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, or the, the foreign students coming in from China and so on, with the Confucius Institute and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the international emphasis is so amazing and so good now. I was just reading that little blurb. It was, it was in the Gazette, but I think they pulled it from one of the Wayman Mary news things, that something like 49% of the undergraduates here last year studied abroad. and. They said that was very high for a public mm -hmm. college. I mean, in my day, when I was an undergraduate, I think the only opportunities were maybe Exeter. There was a scholarship right, yes. or, or a, a small program for Exeter. Um, and that was about it, I think. Now, when I was teaching in the early days, I mean, there was the Exeter program was pretty active for a while, but it only involved about five or six students mm -hmm. a year, I think. And then they could go to France. Um, was it Montpellier? Is that where we went? Yeah, I think it was. Uh, so I had students who did that. Um, but that was really about it. But I oh, went a few who went to China. That's right. The, once we began to have uh, the exchange with Beijing Normal and mm -hmm. so on, I know some of the students I knew fairly well spent time in China. Um, but my goodness, now people just go everywhere. And mm -hmm. I think that's that's really, really, really good. Um, so that, that's that been just a huge change. I think there is a much, and when you just look at what's going on on campus, I mean, it's much more international, um, all sorts of, of interesting things. And so it's, it's much less of the little southern <laughs> mm -hmm. school uh, that, that I knew. Right, yeah, so if you wouldn't mind then maybe telling me what you believe to be the value of diversity and inclusion or, or the contribution of women on mm -hmm. campuses like William & Mary or even more broadly in yeah, the world. Yeah, well I do think it, um, it really gives people a much broader perspective um, to, you know, to have such a wide range of people and it seems to me in this world uh, there's no going back. We're, it's, a, it's one world, and uh, I think people are going to be working across borders and across cultures, and uh, I think it just can't, uh, it can't be, uh, I mean, you can't say that it's not important. It is incredibly important that they have these experiences and just get to know people from, from different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's probably still a problem with class here. Um, for one thing, it's gotten much more expensive, and obviously we don't, the school doesn't have the money that, say, Princeton does. You know, there was just the story about how Princeton has become much less preppy because mm -hmm. they offer full, full rides to talented uh, kids without so much money. And years and years and years ago, a student I did know very well, um, said to me at one point that she often felt out of place here because she was the daughter of 
a naval enlisted man and mm. everyone else here was the child of an officer. Right. And, uh, and when I met her parents, she was a Phi Beta, I, I remember meeting her parents at the dinner or something, and they were, you know, they just looked working class, they mm. were. The, and, and so she found him, but Myra was incredibly bright and went on and um, she had some sort of fellowship. I think she studied in Birmingham in uh, the UK because uh, she was interested in Shakespeare or something. Mm. And then I think, I'm pretty sure she went on to teach, that she's been teaching um, high school English uh, in Manassas or Manassas Park or something like that. But, but I do remember she just said, you know, really, everybody here is kind of upper middle class or more, and I'm not, and that's been hard. Mm. Um, and I imagine that would still be true, that they're still, you know, there probably just aren't that many kids from Appalachia here, mm. or, you know, way out in the west, and Wise County or Nelson County or wherever, so. Sure. So that's probably something that needs, they need to work on, mm. <laughs> but that takes money, so. Yeah. Yeah, as do most things, unfortunately. But yeah, no, that's a, a great point you make about just having a greater number of experiences and perspectives. Just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially in, uh, you know, smaller classes where the students do have to talk and engage with each other. Um, I think that's, that's pretty mm -hmm. important. Sure. Are you still involved with William Mary, well, obviously you are, you are because you came back to do this oral history, but yeah. what ways are you still involved in William Mary? Um, well, I haven't, um, I really don't go to the retired faculty stuff, they, like the, the, that mm -hmm. annual um, cocktail party or dinner or whatever that they have, but um, I am supposed to be, I mean, I am on the committee for the 100th mm -hmm. uh, anniversary, but my subcommittee hasn't done anything, <laughs> so uh, I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. But but I've been trying to go to a lot of the 50th anniversary things because right. I think they've done a great job. Jackie has really just done wonders with this. They've had so many good speakers and good programs and things. So that really, as I saw Jane Bernard at something, and she was saying, yeah, that really raises the bar for the women's yes, coming year. Yeah, coming year. So. I saw that they announced the Women's Weekend that they're going to do in September, but other than that, I don't know. I hope it's going well, but for some reason our, our committee on um, exhibits just hasn't mm -hmm. been meeting, so I know they had a problem with getting, finding out what their budget was, but anyway. Right. I think the last I heard that there were some plans for an exhibit in the Sadler Center. Yeah. Um, and then I know we're going to be using the oral histories we collect for the 100th to put up an exhibit in mm -hmm. SWIM. That's kind yeah. of separate, but yeah. that'll be up as well. But yeah. yeah, it will be, it'll be interesting to see how the celebrations unfold in the coming year. And even as we continue to roll out celebrations for the 50th. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, I was thinking in some ways, maybe the 50th is easier in the sense that there's such a clear focus Whereas, you know, a hundred years of women, uh, there's so much you could do or, or not do or whatever. Um, I was looking at something I had gotten from Yale, and of course they have celebrated various milestones since, and they didn't go co-ed until about 71 or mm -hmm. 72. So again, there you're dealing with a much more recent um, development and a smaller group and so on, but they have a wonderful um, fountain and monuments that Maya Lin did for their things. And right. I thought, no, unfortunately, we don't seem to have a Maya Lin here, I don't think, and I don't think we're going to end up with a, a wonderful new monument on campus, but who knows, maybe. Yeah, it would be nice to have some sort of tribute to it all. Yeah, to yeah. Mark it. They are, I just heard, um, they got the okay to put the two plaques on the Wren building, one for oh, the yeah. 50th and one for, for the, the 100th, 100. that yeah. will list the names of the women, which will be really nice. Yeah. They're supposed to be fairly substantial, and it'll yeah. be nice to have those there. But yeah, it'll be, I, I look forward to seeing what else is yeah. done and what other celebrations yeah. go on. Because when we first started a couple years ago and had <laughs> brainstorming things, they had a lot of ideas about stuff, but I mean, there were so many, and it, and you would have to narrow it down, And but they were 
talking about, um, well, all the buildings that are named for women mm -hmm. and so on. You could certainly do a little bit with that. And they were hoping at one point to do something with practically each department, but I think that turned out to be too much. Uh, at one point, they were going to ask each department to, I don't know, list the most impressive women mm -hmm. students or something. But, you know, the, I mean, departments just don't have time to do all that. And I, they don't have the records, I don't think, either. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think that is a problem we're finding for both these anniversaries that we don't know so much of the history. Yeah. Which is actually, you know, why it is a good thing to record these oral histories and have things on record. But, yeah, that is something we're really having to yeah, yeah. dig in in the archives and see what is there, what's available, what do we know, what do we not know. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So anyway. Definitely. So a couple more broad questions okay. for you. Well, actually one specific question for you. And I find sometimes this is a challenge for individuals to answer. If you had to narrow it down to just one, what would be your proudest achievement in your career? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, uh, <laughs> I guess it would be encouraging good students to be even better. Mm -hmm. And um, I have kept up with uh, this son. Uh, and, and the problem with saying that, though, is that some of these people are so good when they come in, <laughs> it's hard to know if you really added um, anything to them. But um, I do keep up with Andrew Zawacki, who was one of the Rhodes Scholars, and uh, we, we're still in touch. And some students from, I'm trying to think what years, uh, da, 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 da. maybe the very, very early 90s, maybe the 80s, but there are a couple women students, uh, one in Charlottesville, one in Richmond. Um, another student out in North Dakota, actually. <laughs> I think she's one of the ones who went to China. Um, I hear from her at Christmas. Um, so, you know, some of the honors students. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd say that was, that was probably the achievement. Yeah. Well, I think it's fair to say that you clearly had an impact on your students, whether for the individual you passed on the street a couple years ago who yeah. mentioned <laughs> remembering your class or for being the very first to introduce an African-American history course yeah. to a bunch of students who might not have been introduced that, yeah, to that yeah, before. You definitely yeah, have yeah. left your mark. Yeah. So last question from me. Do you have any hopes uh, for the future of William Mary or things you would like to see change in the future? Mm. Uh, well, I guess I would hope they're able to um, continue to diversify, particularly in terms of class, because I think, especially at this moment in American history, that's, that's clearly a division that maybe the colleges could, could help bridge. Um, and I guess I would hope it doesn't become too much bigger. Mm. It, it seems to me that, uh, I mean, they're under a lot of pressure to keep growing, but it, it, it seems like a pretty good size. You, you know, there's a huge amount of um, diversity in terms of the offerings. There are a lot of opportunities, and yet it, I think, I mean, I'm on the outside now, but I think there's still a sense of community here. So I would hope they can maintain that um, and, and yet diversify the student body maybe a little more in terms of class especially. Okay, great. So. <laughs> I've had you talking for quite a while, and yeah. I asked you about three pages of questions, but I want to turn it over to you now and ask you if there's anything you have that you thought I would ask but I haven't or that you would like to add mm. that we didn't cover. Mm. Uh, I can't really... I can't really think of anything uh, to add, except I, this is just a f sort of a funny aside. I was sure. thinking the best way to celebrate the hundredth anniversary would be to hire a woman for president, <laughs> but I don't know if that will happen or not. That would certainly be that a would be big celebration. Yeah, that would be 
that would be the thing. And there are, you know, there are a lot of good women out there who have a lot of experience with administration. The only discouraging point, I think, from, from an academic point of view is now the presidents seem to be just money raisers. I mean, they've got to spend so much time raising money. Right. And I noticed there was something, again, in the paper, I guess, about the meeting that the committee, the search committee had with various um, people on campus. And everybody said, yeah, it's got to be somebody who's going to raise money because the state keeps cutting back and so on. Yeah. So that's too bad because I, I think I like the older model of sort of the intellectual leader too. Uh, I, I mean, I know they do have to raise money, but anyway. Maybe there's a holy grail out there, a <laughs> yeah. single person who will be all those things at once, and a woman. Yeah, and that, that would be great. Yeah. That would be that would cap off the celebration. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, it definitely would. Yeah. Well, if you. But don't have anything else nope. sad um well thank you so much cam this has been wonderful and okay. i appreciate you yeah, just sitting down and talking to me about all of this okay yeah well i hope it yeah i'm sure we've i'm sure i've forgotten loads of things but <laughs> well you can always reach back out to me we can add things in notes and all yeah, of that that's if, a be, too, but if i think of something great absolutely. that i've forgotten <laughs> <laughs> absolutely but thank you again okay